Conventional Western wisdom holds that the legend of the werewolf is a product of the Old World, a relic of classical mythology and medieval European superstition. From Lycaon, the ancient Arcadian king cursed by Zeus for the crime of cooking his son, to Gilles Garnier, the 16th century hermit who confessed to hunting children in the woods of eastern France, these dark lupine shapeshifters have prowled the folktales of the old Occident for millennia. Some Canadians might be surprised to learn that werewolf stories independent of French and British influence permeate the indigenous folklore of British Columbia, the Prairie Provinces, and the Northern Territories. In this video, we will explore some of these forgotten native werewolf legends from Western and Northern Canada. At Canada's southwestern edge, across the Salish Sea from Vancouver, British Columbia, lies Vancouver Island, an enchanting land of low mountains, rocky coastlines, and Pacific rainforest. The lonely, mist-shrouded western shores of this great isle, from San Juan Harbor in the south, through historic Clairquat Sound and Friendly Cove, to Chaclaset Bay in the north, are the historic kingdoms of the Nuchalnath, an ancient people more commonly known as the Nootka. For centuries, the Nootka have practiced a strange winter ritual by which certain young men are supposed to become temporarily possessed by the spirits of coastal wolves. The first written reference to this lycanthropic ceremony was made in 1803 by John Rogers Jewett, a 20-year-old English blacksmith who, along with fellow shipmate John Thompson, spent three years as a slave of Maquinna, the chief of the Muchalat Nootka, whose incredible tale we will explore more thoroughly in a future piece. Jewett described this unusual rite in his 1815 narrative of his captivity, writing, On the morning of the 13th of December commenced what to us appeared to be a most singular farce. Apparently without any previous notice, McQuinnah discharged a pistol close to his son's ear, who immediately fell down as if killed, upon which all the women of the house set up a most lamentable cry, tearing handfuls of hair from their heads and exclaiming that the prince was dead. At the same time, a great number of inhabitants rushed into the house armed with their daggers, muskets, etc., inquiring the cause of their outcry. These were immediately followed by two others dressed in wolf skins, with masks over their faces representing the head of that animal. The latter came in on their hands and feet, in the manner of a beast, and taking up the prince, carried him off on their backs, retiring in the same manner as they entered. We saw nothing more of the ceremony, as McQuinnah came to us, giving us a quantity of dried provisions, ordered us to quit the house and not return to the village before the expiration of seven days, for that if we appeared within that period, he should kill us. American anthropologist Edward Sapir elaborated on this secret ritual, the particulars of which varied from band to band, in his 1911 article for the American Anthropologist. Sapir stated that the ceremony invariably took place during or preceding a winter potlatch, an extravagant feast held by First Nations throughout the Pacific Northwest, characterized by gift-giving, revelry, and the wanton sacrifice of personal property. During the first evening of the festivities, warriors dressed in wolfskins and carved cedar wolf masks emerge from the woods and encircle the gathering, howling as they scamper on all fours at the edge of the firelight. The villagers respond to this development by descending into ostensible panic, uttering fearful wails as they douse their campfires. During the chaos, several of the wolfmen dart into the milling throng and snatch a handful of preordained young men whom they carry off into the forest. When the campfires are rekindled, the villagers become aware of the abductions and make half-hearted efforts to recover their lost kinsmen, launching fruitless search parties and setting a wolf trap. The festivities eventually resume and continue for three days. At night, the wolfmen make sporadic appearances at the edge of the village, howling and whistling as they dart in and out of the trees. On the fourth day, with a professed objective of retrieving the shredded clothing and scattered bones of their missing kinsmen, the villagers congregate at the edge of the forest and sing a special song. In response, the wolfmen emerge from the forest with the young men that they captured, both captors and captives being apparently mesmerized by the incantation. After hours of coaxing the wolfmen and their living prey to venture further from the forest, the villagers lasso the kidnapped youths and drive their lupine captors away. 
the villagers proceed to usher the howling initiates, who are all supposed to be possessed by the spirits of wolves, into a longhouse. After donning special clothing and painting their faces black, a group of older warriors who had all completed the same rite in their youth subject the demoniacs to a long exorcism, characterized by singing, dancing, drumming, and rattling. When the wolf spirits are finally evicted from their human hosts, the initiates and their exorcists undergo purification rituals involving dancing and ice bathing before rejoining their fellow tribesmen. Scots Canadian entrepreneur and politician Gilbert Malcolm Sprout, a one-time resident of Port Alberni, Vancouver Island, elaborated on the Nootka concept of wolf possession in his 1868 book, Scenes and Studies of Savage Life. Sprout wrote that, while fasting and praying in the wilderness, in the hopes of acquiring the guardianship of a spirit protector, young Nootka warriors were sometimes said to happen upon a den of coastal wolves who welcomed them into their pack. After a time, he wrote, body and soul change into the likenesses of these beasts. Sprout likened this supposed phenomenon to an ancient Greek legend recounted in the eighth volume of Naturalis Historia, the first century encyclopedia written by Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder. Citing a Grecian author named Evanthes, Pliny described an Akkadian cult whose male members were said to have the ability to transform into wolves. These shapeshifters disappeared into the mountainous interior of the Peloponnesian Peninsula and remained there for nine years, supposedly living among the natural members of the lupine species. Later in his book, Sprout described a savage variation of the Nootka wolf ritual, which he witnessed himself. In December 1864, while he was serving as de facto magistrate for the west coast of Vancouver Island, a wealthy Nootkin elder stabbed his female slave to death, mere yards from his house, in a native village outside Port Alberni. The body was laid out without a covering by the waterside, Sprout wrote, about 150 yards from the houses. There appeared to be no inclination to bury the body, and it was only after the chief had been strongly remonstrated with that the poor victim's remains were removed after two days' exposure. I observed that even after this removal, certain furious rites took place over the very spot where the body had been exposed. The chief feature of the celebration, apart from the murder, was a pretended attack upon the Indian settlement by wolves, which were represented by Indians, while the rest of the population, painted, armed, and with furious shouts, defended their houses from attack. These Indians, Sprout explained in a footnote, referring to the lupine imposters, had their hair tied out from their heads so as to represent a wolf's head and snout, and the blanket was arranged to show a tail. The motion of the wolf in running was closely imitated. More extraordinary still was their acting as crows. They had a large wooden bill and blankets arranged so like wings that, in the dusk, the Indians really seemed like large crows hopping about, particularly when, after the manner of these birds, they went into the shallow water and shook their wings and dabbed with their long bills. In a plagiaristic commentary on Sprout's story, which appeared in his 1887 book, The Races of Mankind, Scottish scientist and explorer Dr. Robert Brown suggested that the Nootka wolf ritual may be allied to certain superstitions once existing among other nations, the Lycanthropia of the Greeks, the Lugaru of the French, the Persian Ghoul, the Teutonic Werewolf, etc. Whether this had not something to do with the ideas regarding the transmigration of souls into other animals, or, as some of them say, in memory of a chief's sons who long ago were carried off by wolves, I cannot decide. A third variation of the Nootka wolf ritual is delineated by American anthropologist Alice Henson Ernst in her 1952 book, The Wolf Ritual of the Northwest Coast. In this iteration, the feast is held inside a longhouse, which the wolfmen invade at the conclusion of a particular song sung by the potlatch patron. Most members of the human wolf pack will have their faces painted black and use woven cedar bark visors to tie blankets over their heads so as to give themselves the appearances of wolves their snouts protruding above their foreheads. The four leaders of the pack have the privilege of wearing carved cedar masks. As soon as the wolves come in, Ernst wrote, the fire is extinguished. Anyone can do this by throwing on a bucket of water. The people now all get up and go to different places, acting as if afraid. The wolfmen enter and crawl along the floor, circling the fireplace once, whistling. Women who have small children one or two years old 
hide these under their blankets, as though afraid of the wolves. After the circuit, the wolfmen go out the same hole they came in. Someone now rebuilds the fire. Two appointed watchmen get up and go around, looking for those who are missing. Ernst explains that the young initiates are brought by their captors to a special secluded house in the woods, where they are supposed to become possessed by wolves. One by one, she wrote, they are seized by the spirit or force, and act as though overcome. In a daze or faint, they are carried to the middle of the room, and covered by blankets. After four days of feasting, punctuated by intermittent rituals with the ostensible purpose of rescuing the kidnapped children, the villagers coax the initiates back to civilization by singing songs intended to appease the canine spirits that have taken possession of their bodies. There follows five days of increasingly intense exorcism, succeeded by three days of ritual purification. East of Vancouver Island, across the Strait of Georgia, is British Columbia's lower mainland, the valley of the lower Fraser River. Once covered by dense lowland forests, this coastal region is the historic domain of the Downriver Halkamalum, a collection of central Coast Salish First Nations. According to the aforementioned Robert Brown, there is an old Halkamalum werewolf legend featuring a hunter from what is now Fort Langley, British Columbia, located across the Fraser River from Maple Ridge. Stakia, the wolves, Brown wrote, were once a tribe of Indians who were turned into their present form for their evil deeds. One day, a hunter of Kwantlen went into the mountains to seek his medicine. He traveled all that day and all the next day. Still he dreamt not of his medicine, but he resolved to find it, be a great hunter, or die. One day, he saw the light of a great fire on the side of a mountain, and drew near. Round it were the wolves sitting in a circle, talking of the day's hunt. They had taken off their skins, and were drying them on sticks. Our hunter sprang within the light of the fire, and instantly the wolves jumped into their skins again, and howled round him. But the hunter moved not, and lay down and slept uninjured. That night, he dreamt of his medicine, and the next day he began to travel with the wolves, not his guardians, and did so for a long time, until his friends grieved for him and thought him dead. But one day, a hunter saw him in the mountains, traveling along the hillside with the wolves. Sometimes he traveled on two legs, more often on all fours. His face was bearded like that of a wolf, and he looked savage and fierce. So the young man went back to his village and told the story. Brown went on to describe how the man's friends captured the werewolf, with strong nets they fashioned from elk sinew, and brought him back to Kwantlen. There, they discovered that their wild friend had lost all his human attributes, including the ability to speak any human language. Every night, his mournful howls were answered by his new lupine kindred, who lurked in the forest beyond the village. Eventually, the wild man slipped out of his tether and scampered into the woods. This time, the villagers did not pursue him. Legend has it that the man was spotted several times since, prowling in the mountains with the wolves. He was last spotted in the Fraser Canyon near Fort Yale, incidentally just a few miles downriver from the legendary underground den of the Dog People, which feature in an old Thompson Indian legend that we explored in a previous piece. Another West Coast werewolf legend appears in Scots Canadian anthropologist James Tate's contribution to the 1917 book Folk Tales of the Salishin and Sahaptin Tribes, which appeared in Volume 9 of the Memoirs of the American Folklore Society. Remarkably, this traditional Stalo or upriver Hulkamalum story bears striking resemblance to the origin story of the Tlicho, or Dog Rib Dene, a First Nation whose traditional hunting grounds lie between Great Slave Lake and the more northerly Great Bear Lake in Canada's Northwest Territories, a thousand miles to the northeast, which we explored in a previous piece. In Tate's West Coast story, an unmarried native girl who lived at the mouth of the Fraser River in the general vicinity of Vancouver, British Columbia, was visited in the night by a mysterious young man who refused to tell her his name. Hoping to determine the stranger's identity, she painted her palms with red ochre, and when he returned to her bed the following night, inconspicuously left red handprints on his sides. The next day, the girl went throughout the village and looked for the mark she had left, 
but could not see them on any of the young men. When she returned home, she found her mother scrubbing the flanks of her father's dog, admonishing the fool who had painted his fur red. The girl was ashamed, Tate wrote, went in and cried to herself. In due time, she gave birth to eleven pups, five male and six female. One of the latter was half black and half white. Infuriated by the scandal, the villagers banished the girl and her hybrid children from their company and beat her canine paramour half to death. The wounded dog slunk away into the woods, and the girl set up her lonely camp on the Fraser Delta. That night, at low tide, the young mother lit a torch and repaired to the beach to dig up clams for her hungry pups. After a successful clam-gathering excursion, the girl headed for home. Upon her approach, she heard the sound of playing children emanating from her lodge. Suddenly, as if realizing that they had been perceived, the mysterious children quit their antics, and the lodge was silent. The mother entered her house and found her pups inside, apparently fast asleep. The floor of the lodge was covered with the footprints of barefooted human children, very much unlike the tiny, canine paws of her pups. The girl was puzzled that her pups had failed to bark at the intruders, considering their outward dog-like appearance, and determined to solve the mystery. The following night, Tate wrote, when she went out after clams, she put her robe on a stick, tied her torch to another one by its side, and hurried home. The pups thought she was still at the beach, and kept on dancing and singing. She crept up stealthily, jumped over the one on watch, and seized the skins of the others before they could get them, and threw them in a fire. Thus they remained children, while the black and white one remained a dog. Tate went on to explain how the pup's father returned to his family when he was healed, in the form of a good-looking man. The dog man was a successful hunter, who fed his wife and children on deer, mountain goats, and other wild game he caught in the woods. Every once in a while, he left choice cuts of meat in the caches of those of his wife's relatives who had treated the dog mother kindly in the past. In this way, he ingratiated himself with his in-laws, and eventually convinced them to accept his unconventional family back into the village. Tate's story ends on a disturbing note. Then the people all returned, and were fed by the dog man, he wrote. The ten children of the girl grew up to be handsome men, and they married among themselves. At the eastern edge of British Columbia lie the towering snow-capped Rocky Mountains, which run along the border of that province and its eastern neighbor, Alberta. The Stony Indians, who traditionally shared this rugged range with the southerly Kootenay and northerly Shuswap, have their own werewolf legends, two of which appeared in Sebastian Chumack's 1983 book, The Stonies of Alberta. Both of these stories were related by Stony Elder Joe Kootenay, or Rolling Buffalo, to folklorist Thomas T. Williams. Both of them are set on Spirit Island, a picturesque isle in Alberta's Malign Lake, named after a tragic ghost story, which we touched on in a previous piece. According to Joe Kootenay, long ago, a great battle was fought in what is now Jasper National Park, between a mountain tribe and their easterly prairie-dwelling enemies. While fleeing from the advancing prairie warriors, a desperate mother belonging to the mountain tribe set her two small boys, named Star Robe and Scraping Wolf, adrift on a raft in Malign Lake, pushing them towards Spirit Island. Shortly thereafter, a prairie warrior bounded from the forest and crushed her skull with his war club. The invader peered out over the water, curious as to the task with which his victim had been occupied in her final moments, but was unable to see the two boys as a thick shroud of mist had enveloped Spirit Island. Following the battle, the two orphaned boys were raised by wolves, who took them into their den and brought them meat to eat. Scraping Wolf took well to the wild lifestyle of the wolves, forging a close bond with his adopted canine brothers and developing a taste for raw meat. Star Robe, on the other hand, felt more at home by the campfire than in the wolf den and pined for human company. When they came of age, the boys left the den and began hunting on their own, making their home on Spirit Island. One day, while they were sitting on the edge of Malign Lake, making bone knives, 
the brothers were approached by an elderly medicine man named Braided Rawhide Necklace, who pulled himself across the water on a crude raft. As he drifted up to them, the old man withdrew four pale blue stones from his medicine bag, intending to give them to the brothers. Before he could do so, a wolf began to howl in the nearby woods, startling the medicine man and causing him to drop the stones into the water. Starrobe put aside his knife and dove to the bottom of the lake, retrieving the stones and returning them to the medicine man. Grateful for the restoration of these sacred items, Braided Rawhide Necklace promised to return in four days and repay Starrobe for his service. With that, the old man pulled back in the direction from which he had come. Four days later, a tall woman with a blue painted face pulled up to Spirit Island on the same raft that the old man had used. This bewitching lady approached Starrobe and introduced herself as White Hand, the eldest daughter of Braided Rawhide Necklace. At her father's request, she had come to take Starrobe back to their village, where she was to be his wife. Fascinated by this mysterious enchantress, who was the first woman he had beheld in his adult life, Starrobe readily accepted the invitation and bid farewell to his brother. Scraping Wolf is alone on the island, Kootenai said. He watches his brother disappear with a tall woman. By night, he listens to the song of the wolves. He sings to the night spirits, I am going to make myself into a wolf. Scraping Wolf built a big fire and invited his wolf brothers to sit with him. For four nights, the feral hunter and his canine kinsmen howled at the moon, beseeching the spirits of the lake to grant the young man his request. On the fourth night, Scraping Wolf grew wolf paws and went away with the wolves into the mountains. Later in his book, Trumac included a sequel to this story, again related by Joe Kootenai and recorded by Thomas T. Williams. It is the yellow leaf moon, Kootenai told Williams, referring to the month of September. Star Robe crosses the mountain lake to look for his brother. On Spirit Island, he finds some mysterious tracks. One footprint is human, and the other is wolf. He follows this unknown trail. Soon he comes to a large wolf lodge. Many wolves are sitting in a great circle. Kootenai went on to relate how a she-wolf approached Starrobe and informed him that Scraping Wolf had transformed into a wolf permanently. Heedless of her assurance that no power on earth could make his brother human again, Starrobe visited his brother that night in the form of an elk, assuming the appearance of that animal through the power of the blue stones he had taken from his father-in-law. Starrobe proceeded to tell Scraping Wolf the harrowing tale of his time in the camp of Braided Rawhide Necklace. Both his new wife and his father-in-law, he discovered, were what he called evil walkers and snake people, preternatural entities, perhaps related to the sinister Soya Tuppy, the serpentine merpeople of Blackfoot tradition. Although Starrobe's narrative is cryptic, it seems to imply that White Hand, through Starrobe's supplication, was transformed into a scattering of tiny brown pebbles by the same spirits of Malign Lake that had transformed Scraping Wolf into a wolfman. And now I come back to my brother, Starro concluded at the end of his speech. I will not weaken our hoop. Since there was no way to turn Scraping Wolf back into a human, Starro used the blue stones to give himself the appearance of a wolf. Kootenai's tale ends in tragedy, with Scraping Wolf being eaten alive by mysterious aquatic animals called dogfish perhaps Bubo or Mountain Whitefish, after failing to heed a warning issued by the She-Wolf. The wolves blame his death on Starrobe and confront him on Spirit Island, where the surviving brother successfully defends himself. The story ends with Starrobe heading east in search of his mother's people. East of the Rocky Mountains are the Canadian prairies, a vast stretch of grassland, coulees, and river valleys once dominated by buffalo. The western end of this geographic region, from the North Saskatchewan River near Edmonton, Alberta, to the Yellowstone River in Montana, is the historic domain of the Blackfoot Confederacy, an alliance of four warlike nations united by blood and a common language. One Blackfoot werewolf story appears in American anthropologist George Bird Grinnell's 1892 book, Blackfoot Lodge Tales, which the author heard from a South Pegan Blackfoot elder named Double Runner on the Two Medicine River in Montana. According to this story, there was once a Blackfoot man who had two shameless wives. 
the man suspected that his spouses had learned their immorality from other women in the band. In an effort to eliminate that bad influence, he packed his teepee onto his dog travois and moved his camp to a secluded butte overlooking a desolate expanse of prairie. Every sunset, the man sat on a buffalo skull atop the hill and gazed out over the plains, scanning the horizon for any sign of bison or enemy raiders. Weary of this lonely, self-imposed exile, the two wives conspired to murder their husband and return to their band. One morning, when their husband was away hunting, they climbed the butte and dug a deep pit at the spot where he sat sentry in the evenings. That accomplished, they camouflaged the hole with sticks and grass and placed the buffalo skull atop this flimsy covering. Later that afternoon, the hunter returned to camp with cuts of a buffalo that he had killed. After eating the meal that his wives prepared for him, he ascended the butte, as was his custom, and sat down on the buffalo skull. The trap door gave way, and the hunter plunged down into the pit. He was injured so badly by the fall that he could not climb his way out. Satisfied that their husband would die a slow and agonizing death, the wicked wives packed their teepee onto their travois and set out for the main camp. When they came within earshot of the camp, they began to wail, later explaining to their concerned kinsmen that their husband had failed to return from his hunting trip. Meanwhile, back at the butte, the injured hunter was found by a Great Plains wolf, who sent word of his discovery to other prairie predators. Soon, a menagerie of wolves, coyotes, foxes, and badgers were standing around the edge of the pit, gazing down at the helpless native. In this hole, the wolf declared, is my find. Here is a fallen-in man. Let us dig him out, and we will have him for our brother. The other canines did as proposed, and soon the hunter was liberated from his underground prison. After feeding him a raw bison kidney, the wolves dragged the cripple to their den. Here, Double Runner said, was a very old blind wolf who had powerful medicine. He cured the man and made his head and hands look like those of a wolf. The rest of his body was not changed. The wolf man lived among his canine companions for some time. One night, he led his furry rescuers to a piskin or buffalo jump where the Blackfoot had just slaughtered a herd of bison, many of which they had not yet processed. The natives had surrounded the carcasses with snares, set for the purpose of catching nighttime scavengers. Cognizant of these hazards, the wolfman sprang the traps, allowing the wolves to gorge themselves on the fresh meat. The wolfman and his four-legged friends repeated this thievery several nights in a row. Baffled as to how the wolves consistently evaded their traps, the Blackfoot stopped leaving their good meat out at night, prompting the wolfman to let out a blood-curdling, half-human howl which convinced the Blackfoot that they were dealing with a werewolf. So they put pemmican and nice back fat in the piskin, Grinnell wrote, and many hid close by. After dark, the wolves came again, and when the wolfman saw the good food, he ran to it and began eating. Then the people all rushed in and caught him with ropes and took him to a lodge. When they got inside to the light of the fire, they knew at once who it was. They said, this is the man who was lost. No, said the man, I was not lost. My wives tried to kill me. They dug a deep hole, and I fell into it, and I was hurt so badly that I could not get out. But the wolves took pity on me and helped me out, or I would have died there. Furious, the Blackfoot urged the wolfman to punish his betrayers. In response, the hunter handed his wives over to the Inukatsi, members of a Blackfoot warrior society who administered justice at the behest of the head chief. After that night, Double Runner concluded, the two women were never seen again. East of Blackfoot territory is the domain of the Plains Cree, the hereditary enemies of the Blackfoot, who have werewolf tales of their own. One such story appears in Reverend Edward Hennecke's 1929 article for Volume 42 of the Journal of American Folklore in a long saga chronicling the adventures of Waysuckajack, a legendary Cree hero and trickster figure. Near the beginning of this great Canadian epic, the child Waysuckajack and his younger brother, following a violent domestic dispute, find themselves orphaned and alone on the bank of a river. They are approached by an evil hairy man in a magic canoe named Waymasosu, who will later become Waysuckajack's father-in-law. 
Wemasosu kidnaps the young protagonist and carries him off in his canoe, leaving Waisakajak's younger brother to fend for himself in the wilderness. Brother, brother, cried the younger child from the riverbank as Waisakajak was borne away. I will be a wolf. A Henneke writes that, through his tears, Waisakajak saw a young gray wolf run away into the woods. After numerous tribulations and dangerous adventures, Waisakajak married Waimasosu's youngest daughter and settled down to raise a family. Happy though Waisakajak was with his young wife, a Henneke wrote, one thing served to mar his contentment, and that was the uncertainty of his brother's fate. He lost many a night's sleep when it stormed, for the picture of his little brother running along the bank of the river crying after him was stamped indelibly on his mind. He must go back and find him. One night he told his wife this, and she gave her consent to his journey. Wisakajak returned to the place where he had last seen his brother, and looked around for any sign as to the wolf boy's fate. He soon came across the sun-bleached skeleton of a moose, the bones being neatly arranged in a pile, evidently the remains of his brother's first kill. Wisakajak followed a trail of tidally stacked bone piles until he came across relatively recent paw prints. Fresher and fresher grew the tracks of the wolf, a Henneke wrote, even as they increased in size. The brother was evidently a full-grown wolf now, and Wisakajak felt that any moment he might come upon him. He looked carefully around as he went, so as not to miss him. Suddenly there was a crash, and a large gray wolf bounded away from behind a willow bush. Brother, brother, it is I. Do not be afraid of me, cried Wisakajak. The wolf brother stopped and approached fawningly. A Henneke explained that the wolf man had come to fear humans and was even ill at ease in the presence of his own brother. Wisakajak cleansed his sibling in a sweat lodge and purified him with the smoke of sweetgrass, restoring him to his former human form. The elder brother then welcomed the younger man into his lodge, where he was warmly received by Wesakajak's hospitable wife. Ahenikyu went on to relate two more stories featuring this wolf man, who was compelled to resume or cast off his lupine form according to the task he was required to perform. In the first story, the younger brother confessed to Wesakajak that he had a wolf wife and son still living in the woods, which intuition told him were now in danger. With Wesakajak's blessing, he transformed back into a wolf and set off in search of his wild family. The younger brother arrived at his old wigwam in the woods and found that it had been taken over by a family of wolverines. He found his son living with his mother-in-law in another wigwam close by, both of them in a starving condition. The old she-wolf informed him that the patriarch of the wolverine clan had killed his wife. Rubbing salt in the wound of their bereavement, he forbade his own children from sharing any of their bountiful beaver meat with a canine couple. After subjecting the wolverine to a humiliating defeat at the hands of his feeble mother-in-law, the young brother took up the mantle of fatherhood and taught his son how to hunt. In the second story, the younger brother accidentally chased a deer into a lake, forgetting Wysakajak's prophetic warning against wading into a lake or a stream. He was killed and skinned by water monsters who dwelled in the depths, but was later rescued by Wysakajak who retrieved his pelt and restored him to life. The werewolf legend extends north to the subarctic, to the vast boreal forest which forms the northern half of Canada's western prairies and the western third of the northern territories. In his 1895 book, Three Carrier Myths, French oblate missionary Adrien Gabriel Maurice included an old Carrier Dene story with an unmistakable connection to the Cree Wysakajak story above related. Maurice heard this story from a carrier woman named Lisette Elmock, who lived in the village of Stellico, at the western end of Fraser Lake about 37 miles southwest of Fort St. James, British Columbia. In this tale, the protagonist's younger brother transforms into a wolf when he is abandoned on the lakeshore by the protagonist's kidnapper, who plies the water in an iron raft. Later, after many adventures, the protagonist discovers that his wolf brother was killed and skinned by dwarves on the shores of a faraway lake. After slitting the dwarf's throats in the night, the protagonist retrieves his younger brother's pelt and bones and brings him back to life. Another of Maurice's carrier stories 
told by Zachary Nusahel of Stellico, is nearly identical to Tate's Dogman story set on the shores of the Fraser Delta. In this legend, a maiden was visited in the night by a stranger, whom she marked on the shoulders with vermilion. The following day, she saw an old dog lurking near her father's tent with red pigment in its fur. Soon after, the girl became pregnant, and two months later, she gave birth to four puppies, three male and one female. Scandalized, the whole village broke camp and moved away, abandoning the new mother and an old woman who thought herself too feeble to make another journey. The rest of the story unfolds similar to Tate's, with the mother picking bear berries instead of hunting for clams, and the anomalous puppy, in this story the girl, remaining a dog from the waist down, after she and her siblings were caught in their human forms by their suspicious mother. The Cascadene, who inhabit northern British Columbia and southern Yukon, tell a similar story about a girl who was impregnated by a dogman. This story is more akin to the national origin story of the dog ribs, lacking the subchapter in which the girl's mysterious nighttime visitor is marked by red paint. In this tale, which appears in a 1917 article by James Tade for the Journal of American Folklore, the dogman is the girl's lawful husband, whom the girl clubs to death at night when she finds him chewing on a bone in canine form. In this variation of the story, the girl gives birth to seven puppies, six of them male and one of them female. Similar to the carrier version, the mother discovers her children's true nature on her way home from a berry picking excursion, and the girl puppy, slipping into her dog's skin more quickly than her brother's, remains a human from the waist up and a dog from the waist down. At the end of the story, the mother and her dog children transform into stones in the Stikeen River in northwestern British Columbia, in the heart of Tolton Country, southwest of Casca Territory and north of Carrier Country. The story's peculiar setting led Tate's informant to suspect that the Casca learned the tale from the Tolton. The legend of the Dogman can be found further to the north, in the folklore of the Gwich'in, also known as the Kuchin or Lushu, who inhabit the frozen forests of northwestern Yukon and northeastern Alaska, and in the tales of the Gwich'in's easterly neighbors, the Hare or Satu Dene, whose historic domain is the vicinity of Great Bear Lake and Canada's northwest territories. According to Adrian Maurice, in his aforementioned 1895 book, these people shared a belief that they formerly dwelt very far away in the west, and beyond the sea, in the midst of a very powerful nation among which magicians used to transform themselves into dogs or wolves during the night, while they became men again during the day. This legend, which apparently alludes to a race of dogmen in Siberia, seems to bolster the theory long held by linguists and anthropologists that the Dene nations originally came from Kamchatka, migrating across the Bering Strait land bridge into Alaska millennia ago. Maurice informs us that the legend of a race of dogmen who have heads and torsos like men and legs like dogs also appears in the writings of Abbe Emile Petito, a French oblate missionary who lived among the Dene of northern Canada in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Their name for these monsters, Maurice wrote, is Tlinakeni, which means at the same time dog feet and dog rays. In a footnote, Maurice cites Petito's 1886 French language book, Tradition Indienne du Canada Nord-Ouest, or Indian Traditions of Northwest Canada. One story in the book, which Petito learned from his Gwich'in informants, describes how the dogman lived in tents, never slept, and came out at night to hunt snowy owls and large yellow mice. The Gwich'in believed that these strange creatures were originally dogs, which, through the influence of some preternatural power, had metamorphosed into their grotesque half-human forms. They maintained that their own ancestors had been the slaves of these monsters in a dark country far to the west, and that dog people could still be found in Yukon and Alaska, west of the Mackenzie Mountains. That is why we make dogs suffer and make them man-slaves, said one of Petito's Gwich'in informants. But we do not kill them. It is a crime to kill a dog, because they are our ancient enemies, and therefore human creatures. So we let them sleep in our tents, as we would men. Petito identifies the westerly enemies of the Gwich'in, whom he believed inspired the legend of the dogmen, as a people he called the Kaloches, or the Datini, perhaps the Kolchan, or Upper Kuskokwim Dene of central Alaska. Bizarrely, more than one late 19th century publication identifies the Kaloches as the Haida, 
who inhabit the Queen Charlotte Islands south of the southern tip of the Alaskan Panhandle, a thousand miles south of Gwich'in territory. Another identifies these mysterious people as the Chilkat Klingit, rulers of the Alaskan Panhandle, whom an 1839 ethnography written by Russian Alaskan governor Baron Ferdinand von Wrangel indicates may have some connection to the old Tanana legend of the Tailed Ones, or Monkey Men. There are many more werewolf and dogman legends endemic to Canada, some of which we explored in previous pieces. If you'd like to watch these videos, please click on the end screen cards or the links in the description.